puts it to a zero on the category. Sorry, no, my okay. apologies. Uh, so this is your your first uh, phase B sort of thing, which is some you know official sort of what well, doesn't matter. Anyways, uh, what we're going to talk about today is the era of Aquarius and prophecies. Uh, there's some positive stuff in this class, but there's also some kind of like you know negative doom and gloom kind of doom and gloom kind of stuff as well that we'll have to, to have a look at and, and, and understand how to, to work through. Uh, this is an interesting quote. The poles of the Earth are already deviated, and when our solar system arrives at the exact degree, at the precise original starting point, the poles will become the equator, and the equator will become the poles. Then the furious oceans will change their position, and these lands in which we live will be submerged into the depths of the ocean. Yes. Uh, what we're talking about... Is this the good news <laughs> or the bad news? Uh, it depends on perspective. Look at it. <laughs> what we're talking about is something that's referred to as crust displacement theory, or polar shift. The idea um, being that the... The, the mantle is what we, the crust based on what we live on. You can think of that as the, the skin around an orange. It's a very, very small area of the whole Earth as a cross section. The problem with the crust is it sits on this whole sea of molten lava, which is fluid. And there's a lot of scientific evidence uh, building up, and it's a big point of discussion and debate amongst the scientific community right now, is whether or not the entire crust of the Earth can just slip around at various points in the Earth's history. Imagine a skin sliding around the orange, the fruit itself. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests that happens kind of regularly on this planet. And that's what we're going to look at today. And that's kind of the, the, some of the prophecies and some of the things that uh, lie in wait with the era of Aquarius, which is the current time period in which we're in. But we'll be visiting this throughout the course of the lecture. Uh, now let's have a little bit of a, a look at celestial mechanics. Now, remember, when, you know, it was, we're all part of a great machine, right? You just got wheels inside of wheels and all that kind of thing. The terrestrial year, we're familiar with this. It's just a cycle, okay? The terrestrial year, terrestrial year, sorry, is a cycle that we're all familiar with. It repeats over and over again. The definition of the terrestrial year is the time it takes the Earth to revolve around the sun. You know, that it goes around the sun once a year, and as it travels around the sun, it's at different angles and different locations relative to the sun, which gives us the various seasons. Okay, we get 365 days, and we go through four series seasons, four distinct time periods in that particular cycle. Now, if we zoom out from a much higher level, we see another cycle that exists, something called the Great Sidereal Year. And the Great Sidereal Year is the time it takes for something referred to as the precession of the equinox. And the precession of the equinox, uh, it's the cyclic wobbling of the Earth's axis of rotation, which causes the equinox, the, the autumnal and the vernal equinox, the, the fall and the spring equinox, to move slowly through the constellations of the zodiac. When the Earth turns and spins, it doesn't do it straight up and down. It has a wobble to it, which I'll show you in a few minutes. Normally, this is, this is our Earth right here, and right now the Earth's axis of rotation points at the North Star, points at Polaris. And if you've ever seen those time-lapse photography pictures of the night sky, there's one star that's a dot, and all the other stars become circles over time because the Earth rotates pointing at the North Star. But it wasn't always that way. The Earth just doesn't rotate standing still. If you can imagine on the Earth, the Earth just doesn't rotate like this, with the top of my head always pointing at the same point. The Earth, as it rotates, kind of does this weird cyclic wobbling where the top of my head is pointing at a different location on the ceiling. And that's what this represents here. If we go back a couple thousand years ago, the Earth wasn't lined up with Polaris, it was lined up with the star Vega, and then earlier than that, even the star Thuban. So as the Earth rotates on its axis, it's doing this weird, slow, cyclic wobbling. They call that the precession of the equinoxes. And this isn't esoteric stuff. This is astronomy. This is, this is modern accepted astronomy. <coughs> uh, consequently, around the Earth, we have the different signs of the zodiac, right? And we know the signs of the zodiac are just particular patterns of the stars. Well, as this Earth does the cyclic wobbling, it causes something interesting to happen. At different points in this Earth's rotation, as it completes this big cycle that we see here, the spring and summer equinoxes, when the sun rises in the morning, because of the Earth being aligned at different points in the sky, on the, di sorry, on the spring and summer equinoxes, when the Earth is aligned at different points in the sky, we see different constellations visible. Okay, so the night sky, as we go out and look at it right now, 
50,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, did not look the same. It's always moving. If you've ever watched any programs about you know, places like Stonehenge or the ancient pyramids, you look at them now and there's no significant astronomical alignments. But you rewind back in time to when they were built and there's all kinds of different astronomical alignments. There's even, a, I'm a little bit of an astro, uh, amateur astronomer myself and I have a piece of software uh, for astronomy and you can type in any date you want and give a location, latitude, longitude, and it'll show you what the night sky looked like. Just because it's a, this pattern is predictable, just like the regular year that we have as the Earth travels around the sun. Yes. It's always those three. It just kind of goes around, just, always. Yeah, just oh, goes yeah. around that big cycle. That's, okay. that's the, the cyclic wobbling it does. Okay. And as it goes around there at the different equinoxes, at the different points in time, the Earth is pointing at different signs in the zodiac. Okay? What's the time frame lead for that? Well, 25,000 years and change. The complete. That's the 26,000 year thing they're talking yes, about? Yes, that's the 26,000 year cycle. 25,800 and some odd, I believe, which I think is the next slide. Ah. The precession causes the various astrological ages. Each age is about 2,160 years. And then after that, we've then shifted to another sign of the zodiac. Then after that, we've shifted to another sign of the zodiac. So each age is named after the sign which rises in the spring equinox. Why we call the age of Aquarius, and now for the rest of the night, I'm going to have that 60s song from that musical <laughs> hair stuck in my mind. I just can't get that up now. This is why we're in the age of Aquarius, because in this time period, the way that the Earth is aligned on the procession of the equinoxes, in the spring equinox, that's the constellation that's visible. What was the one before us? Pisces. Should be Pisces. Pisces. She goes backwards. Oh, okay, remember Jesus being the fisher of men and all the <coughs> symbols associated with Jesus and fishing and that kind of stuff? That's because it was the era of Pisces and Jesus was the messenger. He was the avatar for the age of Pisces. That's why you see the reference to fish and fishermen and that kind of stuff. He was the fish guy. It doesn't follow like what we think of that way as Aquarius. Mm -hmm. it's the Before that, it's the inverse. It's the inverse. Ah, yeah. got it. It goes the other way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah I've, I've read some stuff that suggests that this 2,000 year cycle, mm -hmm. the 26,000 year mm -hmm. cycle, are all coming at the same time in 2012. We're all renewing or hitting at the same point. Yeah, not, not the 2,000 year cycle, no. We've okay. already crossed into the new one. But, and oh, yes, okay, yeah. somewhere around about now, not 2012, but somewhere around about now, we're hitting the end of this. We've yes. already shifted into the end of this when we shifted into the age of Aquarius. Okay, and that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna look at today. And that's why some people talk about the Mayan, you know, 2012 thing, mm -hmm. because these are, cycles are all coming together. Uh, well, but they're coming together. You've got to do some serious speculation and bending of things to make that happen. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, the, we moved in, and well, this is coming up. We moved into the age of Aquarius, I believe, in 1962. So that's when the times of the end actually began. Um, when you look into 2012, I'm kind of against 2012. Every time people talk about 2012, you see me furrow my brow. There was one man that was responsible for that, and he took some serious liberties to get things to align up for 2012. And actually, everybody says, okay, well, the Mayan long count calendar ends then. But if you look into it far enough, the Mayans regularly made references to dates outside of the long count calendar. So it's kind of like a bit of a buzzword. I was, uh, in, a, uh, I was in chapters with a friend a couple of weeks ago, and I wandered over to the New Age section, as I'm apt to do, and I couldn't believe the number of yeah, titles I was seeing with 2012 on. I was losing my mind. I was like, what is going on? Uh, it's just like a buzz thing that people have logged on to. It's the new Y2K, right? Because we love to fear. We talked about that last week, right? How much fear drives and controls us, and we love the concept of fear, and it's just something else to be afraid of, right? 1999 with Nostradamus, everything was aligning to 1999, it was the new century, it was Nostradamus, it was prophecies from all these different religions, and people were going out and buying propane tanks and gas generators, because that was going to be it, it was the end, and here we are 11 years later, and, you know, that's the thing, we're going to look at some of that today as well. So we got roughly 26,000 years for what we call the Great Sedula Year, it's a time for the Earth to do one of those wobbles. And as it does that wobble, it aligns to different constellations at the spring equinox, which gives us the different ages. So that's where we get the age of Taurus or the age of Pisces or the age of Aquarius or whatever we got to be in. Instead of four seasons on that trip, just like we have in the year, we get four ages. Okay? We get the golden age, which is analogous to the spring. We get the silver age, which is analogous to the summer. We get the copper, which is the autumn. And we get the iron, which is the winter. Okay? Just like uh, the golden is 
just for straight. Another one of those days. Just like spring is the age of growth and rebirth and everything renewing, the opposite of that is winter, which is the time of you know death and all that kind of stuff. And there's some analogies to these that we're going to use when we examine the different ages, the different astronomical ages that we find ourselves in. Each human race lasts as long as it takes to complete this orbit around the zodiacal belt. So each different race of humanity lasts about 26,000 years. And we'll explore today why that occurs as well. Okay, so each race of humanity, and this is something else that we have to kind of think about, uh, we are not the only race of humans that have walked this planet. There's been races before us. For example, one of the most famous other races is the Atlantean race, as an example. And we know the Atlantean race met their end by being submerged in water. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I've, I've been looking up a bit, and uh, uh, I've heard uh, in a few esoteric schools, they teach that the zodiacal belt actually has a 13th zodiac, which is the zodiac of the snake. Is there, is there anything uh, I don't know. I've on? never come across that. No. I actually can't comment on that because I've never, never seen that before. Um, so each human race lasts as long as it takes to complete this orbit around the zodiacal belt. So each race of humans we get approximately 26,000 years on the planet. And each race, consequently, goes through four specific time periods, four specific ages. Just like in one year, we go through the four seasons, one human race goes through the four ages. The Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Copper, sometimes called the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. We were previously in the age of Pisces, as we mentioned earlier, and that's where the concept of Jesus and being fishermen, you know, fishers of men and all that kind of stuff. He was very related with the fish because he was the avatar, the messenger, the one that brought knowledge to the people for the age of Pisces. But on February 4th, 1962, somewhere between the hours of 2 to 3 p.m., the age of Aquarius began. Okay, and some of us in this room were alive then. So what were you doing in February 1962 between 2 to 3 p.m.? Okay, that was the time we transitioned from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. And if you start this uh, debate amongst uh, astronomers, you get a bit of a, a, a heated argument, specifically when that was. Problem being, it's not like, you know, there's one constellation and then another one suddenly appears. As you're gradually moving from one to the other, there's a gray zone where you're going to be in both for a while. And how do you decide exactly when you go from pointing at that picture to pointing at that picture? There's a point in overlap where you're kind of a both. So consequently, there's a bit of debate specifically when that was. But Master Samuel was, came forward and he said, this is it. February 4th, 1962, between those 2 3 p.m., that's when we officially switched into the new age, the age of Aquarius. Our present race, the race of humanity that is occupying the planet right now, was born in the last age of Aquarius, after the universal deluge, the Great Flood. The Great Flood is interesting because that's something that a lot of the world's religions share. For example, Christianity appears as Noah and the Flood in the Ark, right? We see that myth appear again in Aquarius. It appears in aspects of uh, Chinese mythology. It's a regular occurrence on the planet, the idea of a regular flooding. And we'll see why today that comes up regularly in humanity's history. Once again, we've returned to the age of Aquarius. The great sidereal year is almost complete. We're back where we started, which means our 26,000 odd years is getting pretty close to the end. Okay, our race began in Aquarius. Now we've arrived back to the starting point. We've arrived to back to where we came. And what we're going to look at today is, is just what happened. Why is it we only last about 26,000 years? Let's have another look at the four ages, the, the gold, the silver, the copper, or the bronze, and the iron. There has been and will be other races of humanity that exist. We like to think that the be all end all, that no one has come before us, and no one will ever be able to match our you know, crowning uh, achievements. But it turns out we're, there's been other races of humans before us, and there'll be other races of humans that come after us. We are the fifth of seven, where what's referred to as the Aryan race. This is a hard word to say, it makes company now. Thank you, Adolf Hitler. Um, he stole that word. Okay? The Aryan race describes everybody on the planet right now, no matter what color, race, creed, whatever. Every human that walks this planet belongs to this race. To call it the Aryan race is analogous to calling the previous race the Atlantean. 
It's describing a race of people. What uh, Hitler and his craziness was trying to do was purify the Aryan race, which now people think means blonde haired, you know, blue eyed. Yeah, he stole that and he ruined it for everybody. So you can't really say this anymore, mixed company, you know, because you got to be careful because people give you a funny look. But that's what it is. That's but what he was trying to do. But didn't he pass, or, or maybe I'm just reading the latest pop culture, but isn't the spelling that he used with a Y instead of an I? You see it sometimes both. Okay. I am intentionally using it with an I right now to intentionally not use it <coughs> with a Y, so people don't give you much of a raised eyebrow when I use it. Right. But remember that he was a, he was an esoterist. He was really into the occult and esoteric teachings. He studied a lot of that stuff, so he stole this term. This term was in existence long before he came along. It's just the way he used it has kind of stigmatized this particular word, yet we are the Aryan race, and that includes every single man, woman, or child on this planet right now. They all collectively belong to the Aryan race. We are the fifth of seven, okay? There's been four previous races before us, and there's two that are going to come after us. And then we look at a, a different type of cycle that happens to the planet itself. We have to zoom out on a much greater scale than even the great sidereal year to look at what happens to the planet and why there's only seven races, but we'll save that for another day when we look at the seven races and sub-races that have existed. Each race goes through four ages. The ages represent periods, or you could almost think of them as stages of development. The gold, the silver, the copper, and iron. As each age comes, humanity gets more and more degenerated and involuted as the ego complicates itself. When a new humanity starts, it always starts from the ashes of the previous race. The analogy of the phoenix rising from the ashes. A new race of humanity always begins from the ruins of the previous race. And it's usually those with the awakened consciousness that manage to get through the disasters and the catastrophes of the previous race. And those with the awakened consciousness go on to start the new race of humanity. Because they're of awakened consciousness, they get to experience what we refer to as the Golden Age, where the majority of humanity has an awakened consciousness and the ego is almost eliminated. So the balance, the scales, tip in the favor of the consciousness. And this is the age when the gods rule. This is the age when the spiritual beings walk the earth. This is the age or the time period when the divinities, the awakened masters, take physical bodies to exist on the earth to grow and develop. As time goes on, we see the balance go from consciousness to ego as the ego starts to grow corrupt and people become involuted until the scale tips the other way where the consciousness is the one that's small and dim and it's the ego that's strong. That's the Iron Age, okay? And unfortunately for us, that's the age that we're in right now where the voice of the, the higher being, you know, basically the God and spirituality and the divine spark within us, so many people are so far disconnected from that, that it's the ego that reigns in the Iron Age. Yes? So at the end of the uh, last um, uh, race, the Atlantean mm -hmm. race, mm -hmm. um, when, um, when the end came, the Iron Age for the Atlantean race, mm -hmm. um, and degeneration occurred for the Atlantean race, mm -hmm. Um, on the ashes of that race came the Aryan race, mm -hmm. but how many uh, Atlanteans were able to, or were the Atlanteans the, uh, the fathers of the, the Aryan, the new Well, one of the things that, that happened is, is just to quickly get us out of this, the, the, the uh, continent, continent of Atlantis, people were, where was Atlantis, where was Atlantis, it was, well, it was right in the middle of the ocean that's named after it. The Atlantic Ocean, right? So just quick look. Here's I'm not, you guys know I'm a bad artist. This is North America. This is South America. Kind of looks like that, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, this is this is England right there, and there's Europe down here, and uh, this is Africa, which kind of looks like that. If I'm correct, right? Yeah, that's okay. good. That's good. Good. Well, good. Yeah. well uh, Atlantis basically sat with a big landmass that sat right in the middle of here. One of the things that was happening when, when this continent, and we'll look at why this continent was submerged and all these, these uh, climate and other catastrophes happened, when this continent disappeared, uh, some of the people that lived there were able to flee to areas that they knew would have survived the catastrophes that were you know, wrecking the planet. So we had a bunch of people that took off this way and kind of took off this way. 
Um, and those people became the ones who started the cultures of the Egyptians and the Mayans and Incans. That's why we see so many similarities in the religion and the architecture and the pyramids of South America and Egypt, because they were started by the survivors of the Atlantean race. Okay, so the Aryans are, are, are the uh, survivors? Descendants, the you descendants call it, of, of the, the uh, Atlanteans. Yeah. Survivors of the Atlanteans. Yeah. So where did the Lemurians come in? The Lemurians were the ones before the Atlanteans. So if you look at the, the pedagogy, it was the uh, uh, the protoplasmic, the hyperborean, the Lemurian, the Atlantean, the Aryan, and then something called the Koradi that comes after us. And we'll look at that later. That's a whole other class. But the Lemurians were the ones that came before the Atlanteans. Well, they were supposed to be uh, scholars. We're going to say scholars, mm -hmm. I must say. And weren't the Atlanteans supposed to be warmongers? In the end of the Jijin, yeah, when they degenerated, yeah. 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 And that's the problem. Every race begins, well, not so much. We have to back a little bit further. See, the Lemurians, they had the advantage. The first half of the Lemurian race, the eagle didn't exist, and they were almost purely spiritual beings. We see, we see the eagle arriving towards the end of the Lemurian race, and it just keeps getting stronger as each race as time goes on. Uh, so as time goes on, the humanity starts out pure, and then slowly degenerates into the stage that we're in right now. Uh, the Golden Age then represents the perfect, the pure humanity, and we like to say the God's rule. It's the will of the Father that rules the Golden Age. I don't mean the Father is some kind of God, I mean the Father of all of us. We all have our own Father, you know, our Father who art in heaven. That's just a prayer to our higher self. During the Golden Age too, remember that masters, spiritual beings who need to develop, they have the ability to choose the time and place they take a physical body. In the Golden Age, that's when a lot of the awakened consciousness, the beings of awakened consciousness, come back in physical body to further develop and work on themselves. Okay? They all bail on the Iron Age for the same reason that if you had a bowl of you know, good fruit and you placed one rotten fruit in it, what would happen? All the food goes rotten. So we hardly have any masters walking the earth right now because the pull of the ego is so strong, they don't even want to be around because a master can fall. Okay, it's possible for a master to fall, lose his consciousness, and have to go through that process again. They're, they're kind of uh, avoiding us right now. They're just avoiding the world as a whole. Mm -hmm. Silver is where humanity starts to tarnish and lose its purity. You can think of the Golden Age as pure consciousness, no ego. But every being that comes to the physical world is trapped by the illusion and the oasis, the false mirage of desire, which gives birth to the ego. So it's just a matter of time before that ego starts to grow and develop again. That's where we see the ego begin to develop. In copper, the copper age, that's where humanity really starts to separate itself. That's where we start to develop borders, the concept of mind and possessions, and where we really see the ego start to take hold. And then finally we get to the Iron Age, which is referred to as the dark times of Kali Yoga. And that's the truly difficult and terrible times where there's so much ego. You know, that, that inner spark in so many people is so dim and it's so far that it's barely even perceived anymore. And it's just a constant balance. Just imagine a pendulum swinging from one side to the other. That's all this is. Okay? We're always trying to correct that balance. It's the movement between light and dark. It's the tension that's created in the energy flow that, between those two points that brings about all of creation. Okay? So it's a constant swing between the ego and the consciousness. The ego and the consciousness. We just get caught up in that. And consequently for us, the unfortunate side is our humanity is presently in its Iron Age. We live in the Iron Age where it's really the ego and everywhere we look, we see examples of the ego and, you know, there's so much greed that drives the world and war and pain and suffering because we're in the age of Kali Yoga. Oh, this is a huge one. This is Daniel the Prophet talking. You might have heard this before if you've studied any uh, biblical stuff. It comes to my memory in these moments, Daniel the Prophet. This is Master Samuel speaking, sorry. Daniel said that he saw in a vision a great ocean and four winds combating each other. And then he said that he had also seen four beasts that came up from the bottom of the sea. The first beast was like a lion that had the wings of the eagle and it was given a man's heart. The second beast looked like a bear. The third had four wings and four heads. It looked somewhat like a leopard. And the fourth was different from all the rest. It had great iron teeth and nails. Everything it chewed was reduced to dust. It was permitted to destroy the earth everywhere and bring desolation to all corners of the world. It was also permitted to fight against the saints from high above, but a judge came who sat and took its kingdom away. The kingdom was then given to the saints. The golden age had arrived. When we go back and analyze what's happening, the four beasts represent the four ages. 
Okay? The first beast was like a lion. A lion is always a symbol used for someone with awakened consciousness, a being of the higher dimensions. A lion given a man's heart, um, so a lion with the wings of an eagle, a lion with wings like think of it, an angel, an angelic being, given a man's heart, those are the awakened consciousness, the beings from the higher dimensions coming down and taking a physical body, being given the, the, the man's heart. The second beast represents the Silver Age, the third represents the Bronze or the Copper Age, but then we see the fourth one was different. It even, or Daniel even referred to it as having great iron teeth and nails. That's the Iron Age. And doesn't this sound like what our uh, humanity is doing right now? Everything it chewed was reduced to dust. It was permitted to destroy the earth everywhere and bring desolation to all corners of the world. It was also permitted to fight against the saints from high above. The idea that we have ego that can do its own will, that we can fight against our higher self. Rather than, than following the will of our father, rather than doing the right thing, following the will of our higher self, we can do the will of our ego. That's the concept of fighting basically the saints from above. We can do what we want. We can disobey you know, our father in heaven that wants us to do all these things and you know, love a fellow man and all that kind of stuff. But a judge came. The judge, of course, is representing the karma and the great changes that we're going to be seeing coming to our humanity. The judge came and took our kingdom away, and this kingdom was then given to the saints again. The golden age has arrived. So eventually we lose our kingdom, and the next race begins. So the visions of Daniel the prophet basically describes the four ages that humanity goes to, or goes through, sorry. So, end of each race. Another long one. Sorry, this is Pastor Samuel again. If we carefully study the solar stone, the Aztec calendar, we will find extraordinary wisdom. The Nahuatls, which is a busy tribe of the Aztecs, they say the sons of the first sun were devoured by tigers, the sons of the second sun were destroyed by strong hurricanes and were transformed into monkeys and apes, the sons of the third sun died by the action of the sun, of the rain of fire and huge and huge earthquakes, earthquakes, not earthquakes, earthquakes, and were transformed into birds. They say the sons of the fourth sun were swallowed by the waters, they were transformed into the fish. But they don't say anything about the sons of the fifth sun. However, if we investigate what will be the fate of the sons of the fifth sun, the Nawadal say how they will perish, and they explain it when they speak about the future. The sons of the fifth sun, they say, will perish by fire and earthquakes. What we're talking about here is the previous races of humanity. The sons of the sun describe each race. The sons of the first sun were the first race of humanity. They were the protoplasmic race. Okay? Devoured by tigers, that's, that's, that means wisdom. The first race that existed, there was no ego. They all self-realized. To be devoured by tiger, devoured by tiger, sorry, is to be devoured by the wisdom. It's a, it's a symbol for the awakening of the consciousness. The sons of the second sun were destroyed by strong hurricanes and were transformed into monkeys and apes. The transformation into monkeys and apes is a symbol of involution because it was the second race that we start to see the development of the ego and that sort of thing. The sons of the third sun died by the action of the sun and the rain of fire and huge earthquakes, transformed into birds, another animal symbol representing once again the concept of evolution. The sons of the fourth sun were swallowed by the waters, that's the Atlanteans. The sons of the fourth sun swallowed by the waters and transformed into fish, once again we see the animal context. And the sons of the fifth sun, that's us, destroyed by fire and earthquakes. So we see the idea, we've got fires, earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, that kind of brings the end to each race of humanity, with the exception of these guys right here. The first race, the pure race, the ones with the, they were the uh, ones that had the awakened consciousness and managed to escape the hurricanes, the fire, the rain, the water, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's the Aztec sunstone. That's that one right there. And uh, just a brief uh, picture of this. There's four symbols around the outside. Those are the previous four races before us. There's us right in the middle. That symbol represents the current race of humanity. And of course, we know this is a big calendar and all that kind of stuff. That's the Aztec sunstone that was uncovered in Mexico uh, a while ago. It's a big thing, too. It's like 13 meters. And if you're curious, if you want more information about what, about that, it actually hangs above the stairs as you come down. You can see this as you come down. You really always duck to not hit your head, so you probably don't notice it. There's a, a big black thing that actually sits up there. If you want to see that in more detail. Uh, the sons of the first sun, the first race, the protoplasmic, they're devoured by tigers, the symbol for wisdom, they self-realized. 
the sons of the second son, the Hyperborean race, they were destroyed, they degenerated and perished, underwent the process of involution into, into monkeys and apes, the idea being that we are now spiritual, but we find ourselves stuck in a physical body of flesh and bone. Uh, the sons of the third son, the Lemurians, destroyed and degenerated and perished, turned into birds, once again the symbol for animals. Uh, the sons of the fourth son, the Atlanteans, swallowed by the waters. That's where we get the universal deluge, the great flood of the Bible. That's what the story of Noah is. Noah was the avatar. Noah was the Jesus of that particular race of humanity. He was the messenger. Okay? The idea of building the boat represents the vessel, the, the higher bodies. So it wasn't a physical boat that Noah was building. It was a, a, a vessel to transcend and escape to the higher dimensions. It wasn't an actual boat. It was a symbol for the solar bodies. Okay, we used to think of the solar bodies as vehicles. The flood was coming. No one needed a vehicle to survive the flood to go to where the flood waters weren't. That's an analogy for the higher dimensions and working on the solar bodies. The sons of the fifth sun, that's us, the Aryan race, uh, destroyed by fire, which is another symbol for volcanoes and earthquakes. So talking about the end of our race, there's another quote. It is such that the Aryan race, instead of evolving, has involuted, and its corruption now is worse than that of the Atlanteans in their epoch. Apparently we've not even outdone the Atlanteans in all the horrible things that we're able to do. Their wickedness is so great that it has reached the heavens. The Aryan race will be destroyed so that the prophecies that Ramu, Ramu is like the Jesus of the Atlanteans, that Ramu made in the submerged continent of Atlantis will be accomplished. Now, I love this quote. This is one of my favorite quotes made by this um, uh, solar hero of the Atlanteans. If they forget that they must be superior, not by what they acquire, but by what they give, the same fortune will come to them. And that's what our race is all about now, right? It's acquiring stuff. It's a very materialistic society that's really driven by greed. And that's a great thing to remember. If we forget that we must be superior, we have to transcend, not by what we get, but instead by what we give. If we're not able to do that, then the same fortune that became of the Atlanteans will become of us as well. That's uh, one of my favorite quotes. I like to remember that from time to time when you get caught up in the you know, everyday life of money and jobs and buying things and paying bills to forget that in the end, that's not what we want to define ourselves by, not by what we have, but instead by what we give to others. And this is another quote, the Aryan race is truly a corrupt fruit, a fruit that will fall from the tree of life under the weight of its own rottenness, which is kind of a horrible one to think about. Now, when we go back and look at that pattern again, when we look at the great sidereal year, during that zerdi, zerdi, I'm having one of those days, I've been teaching all day. During the journey around the zodiacal belt, the Earth's poles gradually deviate. The present geographical North Pole doesn't coincide with the magnetic pole. Okay, so where North is and where your compass said North is, there's actually quite a difference. Right now, it's somewhere near Hudson's Bay, I believe. Is that correct? You were talking about that earlier. No, it's north of Cambridge Bay. North of Cambridge Bay. Mm -hmm. That's where the current... The 1928 was right at Cambridge. Interesting. It's, yeah, it's, they don't line up anymore. So there's some kind of something happening inside the Earth's core that's causing the magnetic pole to deviate from the North Pole. The poles of the Earth eventually deviate so far that the poles will be the equator and the equator will be the poles. What we're talking about here is that aspect I was mentioning earlier with the quote that started the class. The crust will slip over the mantle like the skin of an orange sliding around the fruit. So imagine that what's at the north and south pole, they suddenly become the equator and the equator suddenly become the poles. Okay, that's what we're talking about right now. Crust displacement theory is what the uh, scientific community is referring to it, and it's a real uh, subject of debate right now, a real hot topic. Uh, polar shift is sometimes referred to as well, polar shift or crust displacement theory. Here's another quote. In a polar region, there is a continual deposition of ice, which is not symmetrically distributed around the pole. The Earth's rotation acts on these asymmetrically deposited masses of ice and produces centrif <coughs> excuse me, centrifugal momentum that is transmitted to the rigid crust of the Earth. The constantly increasing centrifugal momentum produced in this way will, when it has reached a certain point, produce a movement of the Earth's crust over the rest of the Earth's body, and this will displace the polar regions towards the equator. Imagine a basketball, and the basketball has a weight on the top and a weight on the bottom, and those weights aren't even. 
If you spun that basketball, what would happen is that basketball eventually wobble until those weights distributed themselves around the axis of rotation. Okay? That's what this quote is talking about. We've got a whole chunk of ice on the top, a whole chunk of ice on the bottom, which we're doing quite well to unbalance by allowing them to melt way faster and break apart than they should be. So these uneven masses are suddenly going to get to the point where the whole Earth's crust comes sta unstable and flips it this way. So those masses can be rotating around the equator. And that process happens over and over again. This isn't a quote by Master Samael. This is a quote by this guy. Everybody recognizes that guy, right? Albert Einstein was right into crust displacement theory. Okay, so the guy that's laid down some of the most important laws uh, that we've seen regarding physics is somebody that was quite heavily interested in crust displacement theory, going so far as describing the mechanism that would probably produce it. Yes? Do you address how long this will take later on in your... Yeah, we'll look at that. Right? We'll look at that. Okay, so the whole idea that eventually the equator is going to become the poles and the poles become the equator. Uh, science is beginning to recognize polar shift has happened many times before. This is something that's happened regularly at different points in the Earth's history. For example, we have rocks with iron particles lined up pointing to previous magnetic poles. You can dig down, find a bunch of iron, figure out where the iron particles line up, dig down another few million years, get a different sample of iron, and go, these ones go this way, these ones go this way. Uh oh, they don't always line up, representing the idea that that polar area is constantly shifting around. Uh, this is an interesting one. There's something called the Piri Rias map. It's a Turkish map from 1513 showing the Antarctic coastline with no ice 300 years before Antarctic was discovered. The map was incredibly accurate and it's one of those really interesting things that we can't, it's another very controversial thing because there's a section on this map that's down near the South American coastline. We don't know what it is. It looks like Atlantis, the, not Atlantis, sorry, Antarctica, the problem being uh, Antarctica was covered by ice as far back as we know. Antarctica is a landmass, but it looks bigger now because there's so much ice. But this map seems to indicate an, what Antarctica looked like without ice on it, which as far as we know should have been at least 20-some uh, thousand years ago. Uh, there's all kinds of other little things too. Uh, we know that they've gone up to the Arctic regions and they do core drilling. They drill down into the ice and what do they pull up? They pull up plants. They pull up plants and pollen and seeds and seashells as you were talking about earlier. Uh, we know that they used to be uh, quite warm areas, tropical areas. Okay, we know that the poles were never always that cold. Okay, we also see other areas that are cold right now and you dig down and you find woolly mammoths that died so quick that this food is still frozen in their mouths. What, what would happen if these people or these creatures would freeze that fast? Uh, the great flood myth of ancient cultures described the end of Atlantis. Because guess what? If the poles became the equator and the equator became the poles, the crust would move. But what would the oceans do? Rush around like mad to resettle themselves, right? So we see huge floods and tsunamis and tidal waves and that kind of stuff. That would be something capable of submerging a continent. Okay. And that's the other thing as we look at the, across the Earth's history, as crust displacement goes, we find that the continents themselves are constantly going between um, an area of, of you know, below water to above water. Okay. And that's responsible for a lot of the upheavals that we see with various continents and the seismic activity that creates mountains and that kind of stuff. You know, you can go to some of the toppest or the highest mountains in the world and dig in the rocks near the top and you find fossilized seashells. But you know, at some point, that used to be under the water. But as the crust displaces, it's not going to be a smooth ship or a smooth slip. There's going to be a ton of seismic activity as different plates crash into each other to rearrange themselves. Yeah. So the destruction of the Aryan race comes about through fire and earthquakes. Mm -hmm. uh, so the fire part would be global warming. That's one of my theories. I don't know. Well, when you think of any, when you look at crust displacement theory, if that actually was to happen there would be a tremendous amount of seismic activity which would bring about all kinds of huge volcanoes. So you can look at the fire sometimes too as the volcanoes. But I've often wondered, that's something I've wondered for myself, I don't have any way of verifying that, but I wondered if that fire was an analogy for just heat and global warming itself. But you can also look at it in modern scientists that are debating this, trying to figure out what exactly would happen. There would be some serious seismic activity which would generate some you know, volcanoes like we've never ever seen before. All these super volcanoes like Yosemite National Park that are all like creeping up to some big point, that would probably set them all off. So that's one of the, the different theories as well. 
Effects of polar shift as stated by modern science. So we saw what the Nawadal said and how they described the end of each race. We saw that. Let's look at what modern scientists say would happen if we saw this crust displacement actually occurring. They say we would see tremendous earthquakes, volcanic activity, the cause of the fire that destroys many civilizations. What else would happen? Well, displacement of oceans. Tropical areas plunged into Arctic areas, and Arctic areas moved to tropical areas. The displacement of oceans would, of course, explain the flood and Noah and Atlantis and all that kind of stuff. What else would we see? The sudden temperature differential causing massive hurricanes and storms, which the Nuadals described as being the end of, I think it was the Lemurian race, and the end of their race was caused by hurricanes and, and winds. That's something else we'd see as a product of crust displacement or polar shift. There's something else too. What we have to look at is, okay, so we have this concept of each age lasting about 26,000 years, okay? Which we know is the time it takes for the precession of the equinoxes. Well, why would it be, why would there be something that, you know, why would it be that it was exactly 26,000 years, give or take, that caused this crust displacement theory? Why does it seem to happen with a certain amount of regularity? Einstein has its theory about the deposition of ice and eventually reaching a tipping point where there's so much instability that it suddenly tips. Is there something perhaps outside of us? Is there something astronomical that could perhaps explain that shift? And this is what Master Samael talks about. Herculibus um, is a particular planet. Uh, as part of the celestial mechanics of nature, an unusual astronomical event will accelerate the revolution of the Earth's axis. There's something right now, we've got the masses of ice on the poles that are kind of unbalanced. We've got the Earth kind of getting ready to go, but there's an outside astronomical event that accelerates that, that causes an influence to suddenly upset that whole balance and cause everything to tip. Uh, there is a large planet that orbits a neighboring galaxy that will come close to our galaxy. And that large planet, Master Samael gives the name of Herculibus. Uh, so we're going right there. So Venerable Master Samael calls the planet Herculibus. And this planet is massive and will exert a considerable gravitational pull on the planets of our solar system. This is kind of the way that he has this set up. This is our sun down here. Let's draw the sun like that. And let's say these are the planet of our planets of our solar system. You have Mercury, you have Venus, there's us, there's Earth, and then you have Saturn, and Jupiter, and all that kind of stuff, right? And away over here, like really far away, there's another sun. Okay, there's another sun up there. And there's this big planet that's in orbit around this massive sun. And this planet is what he calls Herculibus, this one right here. Now let's say that planet has uh, uh, an orbit of 26,000 years. Around about 26,000 years, this planet swings by the planets in our solar system. And if it's a large enough body, what would happen is this planet would be exerting a gravitational pull on everything down here. And that gravitational pull could be just enough to upset the stability of that Earth's rotation and push it to that tipping point. Okay? And there's all kinds of different scientific theories and different ancient cultures that have described different planets and the presence of some sort of external planet that could be capable of doing this. Okay? The gravitational pull exerted by the celestial body that has a, an orbit of about 26,000 years is what causes all kinds of havoc to the inhabitants of the Earth. Herculibus is so big and belongs to a, a neighboring galaxy that its period of orbit is very long, about 26,000 years, coincidentally enough. This mechanical event has caused the end of previous human races. It's something that happens time and time again, as we've discussed. Um, now, just to I'll back up a little bit. Um, like I said, I'm a bit of an, of an amateur astronomer, and uh, I spent a lot of time you know, studying a bunch of telescopes and that kind of stuff. And when I first heard about this, I was thinking, well, wait a second, I know a lot about astronomy. I don't, you know, I don't really know how this would work, because I have this really good telescope, and I can see I can see all kinds of things. I can see asteroids, I can see all the way out to, to Pluto, and all that kind of stuff. So if there was a planet that was that big, you'd see it coming. Like, come on, we can see quite far. Um, we have all kinds of abilities to, to, to look really far into the, to the heavens. We'd be able to see this thing if we knew it was there. And while I was thinking of these thoughts, it was interesting because I was subscribed to uh, an astronomy magazine at the time. And when I received that month's astronomy magazine, there was a story uh, about these things called a brown dwarf. Um, a brown dwarf is a giant gas planet. Now, 
We know that Jupiter is a gas planet and so is Saturn. They're really giant balls of gas. The modern theory of what they are, they're basically failed stars. We know a star is a giant mass of gas that basically undergoes a nuclear reaction and becomes a sun, right? Well, there's planets that don't quite get the enough mass to do that. And that's what a brown dwarf is. It's like a planet that was, or a mass of gas that didn't quite gain enough mass to become a sun, but it's still out there nonetheless. The creepy thing about brown dwarfs is they wouldn't give off light, so you wouldn't be able to see them. And there are some points in the sky that we regularly watch, and there's one spot in particular that they basically call the hole, because there's nothing there. But that's a problem, because there should be something there. We can look in the different parts of the galaxy, in the universe, we see stars, planets, stars, planets, nothing. Stars, planets, stars, planets, stars, planets. And at first it doesn't seem like a big deal, but as scientists are looking and experimenting more into this, they're saying the fact that there's nothing there is a problem, because there should be something there. And that's why people are throwing around these theories of brown dwarfs, things that don't give off light. There's no sun to you know, illuminate that area of the sky to reflect anything, so you'd never actually be able to see it being there. Is that what they would call a black hole? Uh, well, a black hole is <coughs> something different altogether. A black hole is something different. It's like a star that's collapsed on itself. But yeah, this is an area of the fence. sky. It's a big chunk of sky that there should be stars and planets and other things, but it's just void of anything. And we don't really know why it's void of anything, because it should be full of lots of stuff, but it's not. And that's one of the suggesting, and that's when we start talking about, uh, if you get into quantum physics, dark matter and all that kind of stuff as well. That's what we're hinting at with some of these things right here. The idea being that, yes, there's planets, and there's asteroids, and there's comets, and there's suns, and there's stars, but there's other stuff there. And we don't know what that other stuff is, or what it does. We haven't figured that out yet. So once, once you gain the ability to astral travel, mm -hmm. could you uh, go and check that out? Uh, go and look at that? Not particularly, but what you could do is, and what you can do, what could you can do, is you can go into the Akashic Records and you can see the fate of the previous races themselves. One of the things that this is a weird thing to say, uh, there is limits to the extent with which you can astral project, and those limits basically end at our galaxy. Okay, so you can't go without that? No. Outside of the galaxy. No. You can go to other planets, as silly as it sounds, and checked out Mars, it's really not that exciting. Um, you can go to other planets, but you can't break out of the galaxy. It's almost like a, some sort of a field or a barrier or something that you, you can't cross beyond. You're contained to that galaxy. And I'm making the assumption that all the other forms of life are also contained to their galaxies as well. It's like that's the limits of our backyard, that's as far as we can play, which is kind of interesting. Why? I don't know. I can't really explain the mechanism of that, but that's the limits. That's as far as you can go. You're kind of bending your head once you get out to the edge of the galaxy, which is a really strange thing to think about. Um, Nostradamus, in predicting the catastrophe, like you can argue about Nostradamus and you can argue dates back and forth, but one of the things he said was, in the sky will be a great king of terror. And the great king of terror he's referring to here is this celestial body. Herculibus, as Master Samuel calls it. Uh, her colobus appears as wormwood. Wormwood represents bitterness. If you've ever tasted wormwood, you know what I mean. It's a pretty bitter tasting thing. Um, it was called wormwood because it's so bitter tasting, people used to take it to get rid of intestinal parasites. It's incredibly bitter. Uh, and it appears in the Apocalypse of St. John. And here's the Apocalypse of St. John right here. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven. There's the great star from heaven. And it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. This gets really weird. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. At this point, the waters and being made bitter and everything, that's probably an analogy to our internal waters, our sexual waters, becoming, uh, um, uh, becoming contaminated by the ego, if you it that way. Not becoming pure and light anymore, but becoming dark and bitter. That's Revelations 8.10. So that's where we see Revelations describing the end of the world, referring to, once again, some star falling out of heaven and causing all kinds of problems for the, the humanity that exists. When? We need to know when because we have to make sure that, you know, we pack and get ready and all that kind of stuff, right? When? Uh, Jesus said, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Okay, what's the thief in the night? He's the one that comes when you're not looking. 
He comes under the cover of darkness. He comes when you can't see. Uh, Master Samael, when really pushing for a date, was given the date of 2043, which is the date was also coincided by the Aztecs. Uh, this is speaking of, of the Aztecs. Twelve cartoons have passed and we await the 13th. The 13th cartoon starts somewhere around 2040 to 2043. From here onward, the final catastrophe is inevitable for this Aryan race, which today perversely populates the continents of the world. The 13th cartoon is definitive. The Mayans await it. An elder Mayan was asked, will your children see it? He responds, no, my children will not see it. Will your grandchild see it? He answers, yes, my grandchild will see it. Okay. Um, you can try, and this is something interesting, um, and I've had the chance once to, to hear a, a master speak, and uh, one of the things that was asked of him, and this is you can try this for yourself in the astral as well, you know, when's the end going to come? When's the end going to come? And they never, they won't say. And I remember really pushing once, why, I don't, why can't you say? Of course you can say, you know, of course I know, why can't you say? He said, because it's the nature of humanity. If we said when it was going to be, he would do nothing until basically the day before. But if we say it's coming, but you don't know when, it's in your best interest to work as hard as you can, because it could be tomorrow, it could be 100 years from now. But if we told you it was 20 years from now, for 19 years and six months, you would absolutely do nothing, go on living the way you're living, and then at the last possible minute, attempt to change your ways, leaving it's too late. So it's coming soon, um, as we know, it's going by this, it's probably coming sometime in the next 50 to or so years that we'll see the end of this race, the beginning of the times of the end, the beginning of the catastrophes and that kind of stuff. We're starting to see that now with global warming and hurricanes and storms and winters and floods and earthquakes increasing in severity. We're starting to see that instability in the planet around us. So we're starting to get a taste of the beginning. The idea being when we look at a lot of this stuff, that keeps accelerating. That keeps becoming more and more worse until we get to the point where the earth and most part of it becomes uninhabitable. When? Don't. Okay, comes as a Lord of Thief. The day the Lord will come as a thief of the night. Master Samuel gave us. Now, he originally said 1999, but he revised that. But unlike most people that said 1999, he didn't revise that in the year 2000. He revised it in 1960 something. So, his earlier readings, if you ever come across them, he talks about 1999, and later on he said, no, that was, I had that date wrong. He further investigated and then pushed it further ahead. Question? Um, if the Earth becomes uninhabitable, mm -hmm. then the next cycle, mm -hmm. then the next race, uh, wouldn't be able to, how would they, how would they um, be born? We're going there. We're going there right okay. now. The approaching cataclysm, if you think of it, will not act evenly everywhere. Some privileged areas will shelter people from the destruction. Now, if you underwent, you know, a huge crust displacement, yes, a large portion of the, of the Earth would become uninhabitable or hard to live until the Earth stabilized, but not everywhere. There would be areas that would be relatively safe and protected. One of the strangest things we've done as a humanity is something like 90% of the Earth's population lives within six feet of sea level. If you look at all the big ports and big cities of the world, they're within six feet within sea level. We're talking about areas like, you know, Bombay and that kind of stuff, where you've got millions of people that are literally a few feet from being drowned, okay? Anything that shifted the Earth's oceans by a couple of feet, which is already happening with the melting, they can measure this stuff, right? <laughs> Anything that happened that caused severe tidal waves would wipe out something like 90% of the Earth's population, and that could happen literally in a matter of a few hours. A big underground volcano, and we saw a taste of that a few years ago in what happened in Sri Lanka, right? Some underground disturbance and releases a huge tsunami that wasn't uh, announced by an earthquake or anything else like that. Some large catastrophic event underwater or an asteroid or something like that. You're talking a matter of hours that tidal wave would be able to go from one side of the earth to the other, earth to the other, sorry, and wipe out like 90% of the population without harming a huge portion of it. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Now, how would we know? How would we know where to go? The answer to all of this is those with the consciousness awakened will be able to see what's coming. Because with the consciousness awakened, we can know things before they happen. 
Okay? That's one of the mechanisms that makes it possible for the golden age to start. The phoenix rising from the ashes are those with their consciousness awakened. Right now, there's a large percentage of people with an unawakened consciousness, very small percentage of people with awakened consciousness. Wipe out 90% of humanity, and suddenly that scale's going to tip. The majority of people left after the disaster will be those with the awakened consciousness. They will go on to repopulate and build a new race. And this is an interesting thing to think about because we've all heard of the Human Genome Project, right? They're trying to track, track down the origin of our DNA. And they've been able to figure out that we're talking about every single man, woman, and child on this earth can trace their roots back to a small band of less than 10,000 humans. And the leading scientific theory right now is there was probably some great catastrophe that these 10,000 people survived in one specific location and then went on to basically create everybody that's alive today. So that's like a, a science theory that, um, that everyone today basically shares their ancestry with a small group of people because there's so little genetic variation from human to human. Although we look drastically different, at a genetic level, we are like very close to each other like frightening, frighteningly identical, suggesting that we came from a very small group of people, which also coincides in, with this theory as well. Yes? So Atlantean physiology resembles Aryan physiology? Yeah. Yeah, when you go back, when you start talking about the Lemurians and uh, beyond, then you start talking about humans that look different. Um, when we start talking about the protoplasmic race, at that point, the Earth wasn't even in the fourth dimension, uh, the third dimension. The Earth was still crystallizing in the fourth dimension because the Earth undergoes a big cycle of moving through various dimensions as well. So yeah, the Aryans, for all intents and purposes, look pretty much like us. Uh, the Lemurians were really large. We've all heard the race of giants that walk the Earth. That's described in the Lemurian race. They were physically like us, but a lot larger. And then once you go outside of them, then you start talking about semi-physical versus semi-etheric bodies and other weird properties. We'll look at that later on as well. Yes? Years ago, I read a book by James Churchwood, and there was the seven stages of Earth. And the first stage was one where it was lighter than air. And yeah. it, it lasted a few years, to, and the Earth gradually got denser and heavier. Yeah. Smaller smaller. That's describing that process, absolutely. As the Earth transitioned from the fourth dimension, which is the etheric plane, that's the lighter, and as it crystallized and became right denser into the physical plane, eventually it goes back up again. The Earth's kind of caught in a cycle between those various dimensions, and that's exactly what he's describing. Well, when the Earth though, becomes that dense and that heavy, will it not eventually just call, call in on itself and become a black hole? I don't, yeah, I've never seen it described as that before. It comes down to a certain point, like, yeah, uh, it just, just it's always it. an expansion and contraction. So it contracts and then it goes the other way and expands again. We see everything as a big expansion and contraction. The whole universe kind of works like that as well. Everything's an expansion and contraction. It's sometimes referred to, uh, uh, the Hindus do it really well, that uh, Brahma, Brahma being God, when he exhales, he breathes out, all of creation comes into existence. But later on, he breathes back in and draws it all into himself, and it undergoes that process. The Earth does something similar. It starts as the semi-etheric, semi-physical in the fourth dimension, crystallizes down into the third dimensions, goes back up again, crystallizes, it kind of does this expansion and contraction thing, which is kind of interesting. Well, the book I'm reading now, they're more or less saying that the, those beings in the fourth dimension are really having a lot of uh, a lot to do with how the third dimension lives and they're almost using us as puppet puppets. Yeah, to a certain extent, because we know the egos there, they're not from this dimension, right? They exist mm -hmm. outside of us in the higher dimensions. So that concept of puppets is really interesting if you look at that context. Uh, Master Samuel predicted in the 1960s, this is before anybody was talking about global warming and all that kind of stuff, in the 1960s, in a book called The Solar Bodies, he says uh, that we will see melting of glaciers in the poles. He goes on to talk about increases of hurricanes in coastal cities. He talks about changes in the ocean water currents. That's kind of a really scary one. Anyone done any research into this? Basically, there's currents in the ocean that establish the temperatures that we have, and they're starting to slow down. And if they slow down or stop to a certain point, then we're really in trouble. 
because we're going to see all kinds of extreme bizarre weather patterns. Yeah, actually in recent history, um, in some something like April, uh, our ocean current is being disrupted as of like that oil spill that happened. There's a lot of scientific research going behind it about how the uh, the currents of the uh, planet are now like all messed up because yeah. of our uh, because of big us. disaster, you know? Whoops. Yeah. There's a, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you formally call it science fiction per se, Kim Stanley Robinson has about a three-part series um, where he talks about in extreme environmental change and that mm -hmm. sort of thing as a result of it and sort of puts it in the near future in the same ways where it, everybody thinks it's going to warm up but actually you can go into almost like an ice age. Yeah. Yeah, remember the last ice age, what was that, like not even 10,000 years ago? That's not that long ago, right? That's not, not a big time. Yeah, everybody says global warming is, it's not everything necessarily getting warm, but uh, he talks about, like he gets very specific. It's not just, oh, we're going to see meltings of glaciers and poles. He talks about warm pools of water on glaciers, which undermine them and cause them to break apart. Um, just to kind of show you that idea, and this is something that we've actually been measuring and watching in the last uh, couple of years. So you've got yourself a big glacier, right? These things are huge. They kind of, you know, sit like that. And we've got, of course, a couple degrees warmer in temperature. We've got the sun and the low zone and all that kind of stuff. So we start to see pools of water that build up on these melted glaciers. Now these pools of water, the water goes through cracks through the glacier and pools underneath. And now this glacier is now floating, and what happens is the glacier cracks off at that point and falls in the ocean. And we're talking about glaciers that are like huge falling in the ocean. And there's even YouTube videos of this happening, because people have taken videos as a giant glacier falls apart. And it's like, the big one right now is one off of Greenland. There's a name for it, I forget its name. It's like named after a Prince something. It's a Prince something uh, um, ice field or glacier field, and there's a crack in it. And if that thing goes and falls off, apparently all the world's oceans will go up by like six or seven feet if this thing drops down. Because it's basically like uh, a continent-sized chunk of ice that would you know, slip under the water. And if that happens, then there's going to be a huge tidal wave that's going to go around the world and raise the oceans. And it's kind of frightening to watch. Uh, what else does he talk about? Uh, melting of icebergs, raising coastal waters, and flooding coastal cities. That's obviously a real concern for people right now. Uh, if you've seen the movie Inconvenient Truth, not that I'm in that much into Inconvenient Truth and Al Gore, but uh, when I was watching that movie, I was like, wait a second, I went and dug in that book. I was like, man, he was talking about that 40 years before it became the new thing to talk about. Okay, so that's just some of the things that he was talking about. Any questions about that? Okay, it's kind of doom and gloom in that, you know, well, everything's going to come to an end, but. When you look around, I mean, it, it, it can't go on like this forever, right? It's not going to go on like this forever. Uh, the good news is, um, how, how would we actual, you know, how would we avoid all this stuff? It's simply by awakening the consciousness. Okay? And, if, and if you awaken your consciousness, does it really matter specifically if you survive in this body, in this, do you know what I mean? Doesn't so, matter. Like the survivalists, to me, in some ways, have it all wrong. It's like... If there's an inevitability to it, mm -hmm. try to make yourself a better person now while you can, and then what happens, happens. Bingo. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't mean that was the thing. Remember, if we can, this physical body is, it's, it's, it's on a timer. It's only going to last so long. It's a body of flesh and bone bound to the physical world, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust sort of thing. It's, it's not going to last forever. Of course it doesn't. But if we can work on developing that consciousness, then when this physical body ceases to exist, we continue to exist. Our consciousness continues to exist in the higher dimensions. We don't find ourselves caught up in that dream state again and being drawn back into another physical body. We instead can enter the higher dimensions with an awakened consciousness. We no longer need this vehicle. We then can go on to, to grow and develop and learn and continue in the higher dimensions. Right now we're just caught in that wheel from exi physical existence to physical existence to physical existence. The most important thing is to awaken that consciousness that allows us to continue to have uh, immortality, so to speak, in the higher dimensions. Um, one thing you mentioned about the, uh, the idea of the golden age where uh, the planet is actually on more of a, an astral dimension or a higher dimension. Um, 
would that mean that uh, over time, if you were to expect something like the the transition from the Iron Age to the Golden Age to happen within the next 100 years, you'd also be expecting that the world would be taking on more qualities of the astral plane? Um, so I should maybe back up a second. When we go from the Iron Age to the Golden Age, we're not necessarily talking about a change in the planet itself. In earlier races, it did because the planet, the change of the planet from, um, if you look at the planet going from, like let's say uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, fourth dimension and this is the fifth dimension, we see the planet basically going through a cycle as it goes between the fourth and the fifth. That is a much larger cycle okay. than the precession of the equinoxes. So that's, we have to zoom out another level now to see another cycle, okay? So when we go from the Atlantean race to the Aryan race, and the Aryan race to the core ID, this is still physical. This is still this planet exactly the way it is. There's no actual real dimensional or dimensional change to the planet itself. That just describes those different ages, describe what happens to a race as the planet goes through those instabilities and you know, um, crust displacement and all that weird stuff. Yeah. So if um, evolution occurs with each passing race mm -hmm. and that the Aryan race is far more corrupt than the uh, Atlantean race, then that would suggest that the core ID will be more corrupt even than the Aryan, than us. Potentially, yeah. Is that the way it works? If evolution occurs that way, it's a dumbing down through the races? Uh, yeah, as you go into the Iron Age. I, the thing is, I, who knows with the core ID? I, I have no idea. And interestingly enough, there's not much information that even Master Samael gives about the core ID. Um, but yeah, I wonder that myself. Does that mean that when they get to their Iron Age, it'll be even greater than this one? And then what happens when we get to the end of the seventh? How does the, that whole cycle reset itself? Yeah, because the first race, as you said, they were able to ascend immediately, mm -hmm. meaning there was no evolution for them. So the catch was there was no ego, and we'll look at the origin of the ego in a later class. The ego was actually an accident. It was something that wasn't supposed to be that ended up being. It was we were connected to the. At one point in our existence, we were connected to uh, the negative aspect of the astral, which is the lower dimensions. At one point, we were connected to hell, so to speak, and that allowed the ego to come back up and kind of infect our consciousness. And it's kind of been there ever since. Um, I don't know at some point whether it gets permanently eliminated or what. That's the problem. So I don't kind of speculate on what might happen with the, the sixth so race. So that infection process didn't occur with the first race because no. they were able, they, they were free of mm -hmm. ego. Mm -hmm. So it must have occurred then in the second or the third. Yeah, race. it was as the earth trans or as the earth crystallized into the physical. It was something that was done in an effort to stabilize the physical planet. See, humanity at that time was like a conduit. We were like uh, an energy transformer. We took one form of energy, converted it into something else, and fed it back to the planet. Okay, so we were almost like a, a, a form of a, a solar energy converter, you can think of it that way, as weird as that sounds. Uh, and one of the problems with that process is when we are channeling those energies to a different part of the planet, um, the energy was going two ways and it wasn't supposed to. So we were sending this energy down, but at the same time there's the opposite polarity, it was coming back up. And that was, that was the origin of the ego. And once the ego got into our you know, consciousness, it was there to stay. That's why we battle so much with it. But yeah, the early race didn't have that. Um, I don't know whether it's at some point permanently eliminated or not. I have no idea. No one speculated on that. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we're just living part of the plan that the gods have suffered. Except for us. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, they were the ones, we'll see later on, they were the ones that caused the evil. It was their accident that caused that. Now, um, as far as Ascended Masters go on the higher planes, um, if they have complete domain and, and power over uh, galactic events, they, they have the ability to modify, um, to modify the course of events on, in the lower dimensions, correct? Uh, so some things like those cycles, no. Those cycles exist because they're the cycles. Like the, uh, an awakened master couldn't stop the earth revolving around the sun. That's just part of the physical cycle. Okay, so even if these awakened masters exist at, um, say, fifth or sixth dimension, mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't have the, the power 
to uh, I don't, Yeah, I don't know whether it's they don't have the power. I don't know whether it's like a karma thing they, or whether it's an interest thing or I have no idea. I have no idea. But it's kind of like a natural order to things. I mean, you wouldn't really want to be able to intervene. You wouldn't want somebody to intervene because it's like, what was it, Deepak on Deepak show where they talk about every cell in your body dies, that death is a natural part of, mm -hmm. the, of the process and, and rebirth and everything like that. And you have to remember, too, the higher you go dimensionally, when you look down, that year that the planet would take to roll around the sun is like a microsecond, right? It's such an inconsequential thing. It would be like you, from your vantage point, to use your analogy, deciding the fate of a particular single cell in your body. You don't, it's not only that you're not aware of it, it's just that there's so many others that you just no way you could alter the fate of one particular cell. But to that cell, that would be the most important thing that you could do for it, is make it do something or make it, you know, uh, or affect a particular process in that cell. But to you, it's such a tiny, tiny, tiny part of a much greater thing. Your awareness isn't even really extending to that point because you've got much bigger and more important things to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, now, you say, obviously, there's, there's like these cycles that happen with, um, with uh, the planets and uh, galactic uh, uh, events and stuff like that um, and on the microcosmic scale there's also the cycles the, like the wheel of samsara that mm -hmm. caught on so the is there if, if it's possible that we can go through the process of revolution of consciousness and we we break those cycles we're no longer part of the cyclical nature um, would that imply that it's possible that uh, we would be able to if possibly as a planet as a whole be able to break away from the cyclical nature of uh, our planet's progression, like the progression through the Iron Ages, the Golden Ages, and etc. Well, yeah, if we were all able to awaken consciousness and fight the ego, then that would end those particular races as well. But then you have to remember that when you, you know, as the higher you go, there's less laws. These are the laws that govern this physical universe. Remember, there's 48 laws, basically, to govern this universe. When you go up to the astral, there's 24, and then you've got 12, then you've got 6, then you've got 3, and finally you get to the domain right at the top here that has one law, and that law is basically the will of God, the law of the Father who art in heaven. Everything else basically bounds down to that particular law. So yeah, it sounds almost like a, a strange cop to say, well, everything that happens is God's will, but even even the, all the beings and intelligences that lie below that are still governed by that law. We just have no idea. We can't even perceive what it is because we can't even follow anything other than our ego. So we're running around blind. But the higher you go dimensionally, the closer you get to that one source and then that one universal law that will have gone, basically. Uh, so we have a practice. Let's see what it is. Oh, we're going to do natural om.